I thank you for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation, the organizers. So uh, we've had a bunch of talks on push and pull fronts. Uh, they keep coming up, which is really wonderful and making me excited. I'm going to talk about the uh, really what's happening on the boundary between these and some sort of simple, very old PDE models. So uh, we call these push me pull you fronts. These things that are kind of a little bit pushed, a little bit pulled. That are there's some parameter that takes you to the boundary of the two. Uh, it comes from a Dr. Doolittle, so I don't know, I, it wasn't me who came up with the name, but if you go back and you read the old books of Dr. Doolittle from like the 1930s or something like that, they have this animal that's like a llama with two heads. Okay, so it pushes and pulls. Anyways, so uh, my collaborators for this project are Jing An and uh, Lenya Rijek, and I want to put it here because otherwise I always forget to read the names. Okay, so let's start by just doing a little thought experiment for a second. So take Fisher KPD, right? That kind of very simple reaction diffusion equation, and add uh, take this, so this first equation up here and add a little epsilon times another reaction term that has an the effect. When epsilon zero, this is Fisher KPP. When you increase epsilon just a little bit, you still satisfy this KPP condition of uh, decreasing reproduction rate. So you'll still have pulled fronts that are. The speed in the front is kind of all governed by the linearized behavior at infinity. And as you increase epsilon, if you increase epsilon a ton, you have a complete change. The nonlinear behavior at the front pushes everything, which means that somewhere in the middle, you kind of switch from one to the other. So our question is about exactly that change. Um, I'm mostly going to talk about equations of the second form, where instead you have a kind of advective term in the back, but you can do the same exact argument. When epsilon's small, you'll have pulled. When epsilon's huge, that advective term will push you from behind. So our main questions are, okay, you start from some initial data, like this u naught, this purple uh, uh, heavy side function. You let time run forward. What happens? You kind of form a traveling wave that's one on one side, essentially zero on the other. There's some transition between them. And so what we care about is understanding where that front is, the transition from 1 to 0, we also want to say more. We want to say something about the, the traveling wave, uh, convergence of the traveling wave. So for us, we're, we're wondering, OK, as you vary epsilon, is there some critical epsilon where your behavior changes? And especially what happens at that critical epsilon. OK? Uh, so the, the, the model that I'm going to talk about today is this Burgers FKPP. So it's very simple. Uh, we got it from, you can see it in Murray's book, but there's papers going back to the 70s that I'll mention in a second. Uh, you can think, okay, so for us it's a mathematical model, but if you want to give it some sort of interpretation, two options are one is a kind of population dynamics model with the sort of go or grow hypothesis. So you, if you have a small population, you're not spending your time really running, you're spending your time reproducing. If you have a high population, you have essentially no reproduction, but you're getting, you have a big advection that's pushing you to sort of new territory. For us, we were more coming from it thinking about a uh, kind of combustion. So think of a, a fluid that has a chemical reaction going on. What happens? Uh, the reaction heats up the fluid, so then you have density differences between the hot fluid and the cold fluid. Buoyancy then starts sort of twisting everything around. It mixes it up, it makes it combust faster, and then it, uh, it goes from there. You can write down models for that, and you, they, they become very complicated and completely intractable very quickly. So this is a, an extremely simple sort of minimal model for that. So at least it's, it's some motivation. Um, so what, what's known about this Burgers Fisher KPP model? So there's a paper by Hadler and Rota, whose names I'm sure I'm mispronouncing terribly, uh, but anyways, uh, where they, 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 they analyze the traveling wave problem. And what they see is that chi equals 1 is a transition point. So when chi is very small, you essentially get everything like you have for Fisher KPP. You have a traveling wave. It has speed 2, just like Fisher KPP has. When chi gets bigger than 1, then you lift off. You have a faster traveling wave. And they can identify the speed. It's just chi plus 1 over chi. So we wanted to come back, and we wanted to look at this problem from the not the traveling wave uh, framework of the problem, but the Cauchy problem. You start with some heavy side function. You ask, where's the front? Do you converge to the traveling wave? And what we find is that that chi equals 1 case is very special. When chi is less than 1, you get the front asymptotics, 2t minus 3 epsilon t, plus some constant, depending on the initial data, 
blah, 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 which is exactly like you get for Fisher KPP. So Julian Versticky talked about this yesterday. It's the exact same expansion. So you kind of see uh, nothing different. When chi is bigger than one, you see, okay, convergence in the frame of the traveling wave is what you expect for push fronts. And when chi is exactly equal to one, you get something a little bit in between. That log delay shifts down. You get a different, a smaller delay. So this is what we call the, the push me pull you case. And so th this result is what I'm going to talk about today. Okay, it's too much to talk about in 30 minutes. And, and also, like, even if it weren't 30 minutes, it would definitely be too much for everyone to have patience to listen to in 30 minutes. So what we're going to do is focus specifically on the chi less than or equal to one case, mostly the chi equals one case. And I'm just going to talk about those first two terms. I'm not going to talk about convergence to the lower order term, convergence to the traveling wave. OK? Uh, the Part of the reason for this is that a lot of the arguments for the lower order terms and convergence to the wave are similar to work uh, from uh, Jean-Michel Hochoff, Jim Nolan, and uh, Len Yerujic. Uh, so OK, that's not the, the sort of exciting thing that I want to tell you about. The, for chi bigger than 1, the reason I don't want to talk about it, is actually it's fairly straightforward using techniques going back to Sattinger in the, the 70s. So you're really, I mean, OK, that's 50 years ago. So you're really using kind of known, understood things. OK, so why chi equals 1? All right, you see the behavior in the trailing wave, uh, see that Hadlon Rota uh, computed. but what are some other ways you can see it? So one is you can see that the profile of the traveling wave changes. So when chi is greater than or equal to 1, you can actually compute it explicitly. And you see that it has purely exponential decay at infinity. When chi is less than 1, you get essentially the kind of profile that you see for Fisher KPP, which is x e to the minus x. It's not purely exponential. It has that linear term out front. OK, that's fine. Uh, but maybe it's a, a, a way that. Uh, you know, it doesn't involve you computing traveling waves and doing very long arguments. So one thing you can do is you can move to the, travel, the, the, um, the frame of reference of speed 2, and you can remove an exponential, and you can look at what equation you get. So this phi function, by the way, will be extremely important in this talk. Uh, notice that when chi equals 1, you get something very, very special. You get a, a conservation law. When chi is less than 1, you get something that has a big damping. So these are going to have very different behaviors. One is going to have mass that stays the same for all time, the other one's going to get smushed down. And so that's maybe one way you might see that chi equals 1 is, uh, is an important threshold. OK. So let's talk very quickly about chi less than 1. Most of the talk will be about chi equals 1. Chi less than 1, once you have the right perspective, you can kind of do it relatively quickly. So there are two main ideas that we have here. The first is what we call quantitative steepness. So uh, there's a very, very, very old idea going back to the original Komogorov, Petrovsky, and Piskunov papers, which is about the steepness of your function. So the way in this original KPP paper they get convergence of wave is they prove two things. They prove one, if you start steeper than a traveling wave, so if you start with a heavy side function, which you kind of think of as infinitely steep, then you always stay steeper than a traveling wave. The other thing they prove is that your steepness is always decreasing. So if your steepness is always decreasing and you can't cross the steepness of a traveling wave, you have no choice but to converge to it. And this is actually how they get a convergence. They're not really doing very hard estimates. Uh, so, okay, we owe the, uh, like our knowledge of this to Tomas Giletti and Hiroshi Matano, who have used it for a bunch of things in recent years, uh, like propagating terrorist models. Uh, so our contribution was to say, okay, Instead of using soft qualitative arguments like that, let's quantify this. So whenever you do these arguments in phase plane analysis, you build trapping regions. Whenever you build trapping regions, what you're implicitly doing is getting an inequality, like the, the derivative of the traveling wave is less than or equal to some function of the traveling wave. And if you have the steepness comparison, you can pass that inequality to the solution of your Cauchy problem. So if you have something, like we have for uh, Berger's FKPP, like uh, this top inequality, in this red box, then you get actually the bottom one for free. OK? And this will come up uh, a few times throughout the talk. The other thing is what we have, we have the other tool that we use is what we call a weighted Hofkohl transform. So if you're, Hofkohl's come up a few times in talks so far. If you're not familiar with it, it's kind of this thing I've written at the bottom. 
It's a way to, to take Berger's equation and get to the heat equation. So you can kind of take a nonlinear equation and get to something that's linear. For us, we have a bit more of a complicated model, so we have to take a, a slightly different transform. You see that Hopkolf uh, integral showing up, but there's also a u on the outside, an exponential factor. And here, I'm, I want to go into the traveling wave, uh, the, the frame of reference that moves uh, with the front, at least where I expect it to. And if you compute what equation u bar satisfies, the left-hand side has no Burgers terms. Chi doesn't show up there at all. The middle term that it's equal to, you see that chi showing up. But if you use that inequality I showed you on the last slide from the quantitative steepness, you get that right-hand side is actually, well, the thing in parentheses is, is positive, so the whole thing is going to be negative. Why is this nice? Now, u bar basically has no relation to Burgers at all anymore. And that equation, the left-hand side, is exactly what you get for Fisher KPP when you do an analogous transform, but without that uh, integral term in the exponential. So, okay, by the comparison principle, then u bar should be less than or equal to the same kind of thing for Fisher KPP. This is the complete law. You actually can't use comparison here because there's an issue with the initial data. But it tells you that whatever you did for Fisher KPP should work for u bar, and then blah, blah, blah. So that gets you an upper bound on the front. To get a lower bound, it's, it's sort of intuitively obvious. If you're adding an advection that pushes you forward, okay, you can't go slower, right? Because the advection's helping you. So then you get a lower bound on the front. That gets you up to the O of 1. If you want to get the precise th things, you have to work a little bit harder. But as, as I said, you can use uh, these ideas developed by Nolan Rukshoff and Rizik. So that's by less than 1. Uh, okay, so that's nice. Finish with that. Two slides. So write two more slides for chi equals 1, and then we're done for the talk, right? OK, maybe. We'll see. Uh, so chi equals 1. So let's go back to that phi function. So phi is this uh, removing of the exponential, and we're going to that 2t moving frame. OK? Phi, I'm going to keep, in, in future slides, phi is never we're going to go anywhere. I'm always going to put up at the top in green where the burgers have KPPs. So you know, in two slides, when you've completely forgotten what phi is, you, it's still there. Uh, okay, so what should you expect? Heuristically, what, why, why should you get this one half log t? So suppose you actually do converge to the, the traveling wave. If you do converge to the traveling wave, then phi, you can just kind of compute explicitly using these formulas up here, and you get 1 over root t e to the z over 1 plus e to z. Okay. This thing essentially has an L infinity norm of 1 over root t. And that tells you that somehow this 1 half log t is equivalent to getting this 1 over root t decay. Why should you expect 1 over root t decay? Well, it's a conservation law. If we just ignore the advection for a second, it's the heat equation. The heat equation decays like 1 over root t. OK, so, so with these log delays, they always seem very mysterious. I have 3 halves, 1 half log t. But now you all know that it's just uh, going to be decay of the heat equation of some kind. So you know, if someone tells you something about the log de delay, you can always, ah, it's just the heat equation decay. I know. I understand. All right, so, uh, so, so now this conjecture is exactly what we want to prove. Why should it be true? What does u look like? So if u looks like a traveling wave, it's 1 on the left, 0 on the right. So what do you do to mass, right? You have some mass. In fact, phi, let's say you start with a heavy side initial data. What should phi naught look like? Phi naught should be e to the x, indicator function of s, x negative. So it's something integral. So some finite mass on the left that you start with. U just smushes it over to the right very quickly, just pushes everything over to the right. And on the right, U is 0. There's no drift, so everything just diffuses. So you should get 1 over root t. You can kind of think of it as being analogous to like the Neumann boundary conditions on the, the half line for the heat equation. Right? Things diffuse on the right, and then kind of they bump into the wall on the left, but it doesn't really matter because there's enough space on the right to still get 1 over root t. Okay. So that's int intuitively why it should be true, but proving it becomes the, the mess. Uh, so let's, let's kind of think about that for a second and just see if we can move forward in a very simple way by pretending it's not a nonlinear problem. Just pretend we have some fixed u and some fixed phi, and now we want to get to k. So the problem with this is you have to be very careful. Because if you don't use anything about u, if you only use some qualitative things like it's bounded, then you can build steady solutions of this thing. Steady solutions don't decay in time. So this tells you that you can't just use that u is bounded in L infinity or smooth or 
whatever, you need to use something about sort of where it's zero and where it's one. Okay. All right. So we want one over root t decay. We want to take inspiration from the heat equation. So how do you prove one over root t decay for the heat equation? So the sort of standard standard way, unless you can explicitly compute things, which we can't, is to do the following. You take your heat equation, you multiply it by your function, you integrate by parts, and you get a differential inequality like this first one up here. This is great, you love differential inequalities, you know the L2 norm is decreasing now, but you want to rate. So somehow you need to tie that gradient L2 term, that H1 term, back to L, the L2 term. And you do that using the Nash inequality. So okay, here you use the Fourier transform, and you can prove that there's this relationship between the L2 norm of H, the L2 norm of the gradient, and the L1 norm. It's the heat equation, the L1 norm is conserved, so let's just ignore that for a second. This lets you take the gradient out and put in the L2 norm. Once you have this, you have a differential inequality that closes, you can compute something, you get the right decay for the L2 norm. This is of course only an L2 estimate, you want an L infinity estimate. There's some amazing trick using adjointness uh, that lets you get it. I'm going to completely ignore this adjointness trick because it completely doesn't work in our case. So at the end of the talk, I'll show you exactly the point where the adjointness uh, falls apart. So what we're going to do for the, today is just get the L2, get the L2 decay, and then call it a day. All right, and so that's the key step, and uh, we'll wash our hands. Of course, there's more to it than that, but uh, you know, if you're every talk you get lied to, right? So this is this is my lie for for today. Uh, okay, so differential inequality. So let's take our equation, let's multiply by phi, let's integrate by parts. What do we get? Okay, we get the two terms that we like on the left, and then on the right, we get something that's positive, and we're completely dead now. Now you can, you can be stubborn, and you can say, maybe I can absorb that positive term into the gradient term. I'm telling you, you can't. We like worked really hard. We got a bound of the L2 norm by uh, a specific constant, and then we were like, maybe we can do something really creative. So we started doing the, the sort of Nash iteration. We, you, you iterate from L2 all the way up to L infinity, and then you get instead that instead of bounded by being bounded by that constant, it's bounded by that constant divided by two. Okay, not great. So this, this, is, uh, this isn't going to work. You have to do something smarter. So what's wrong here? Why doesn't it work? The reason it doesn't work is because if you just multiply by phi and integrate, you haven't taken into account anything about u. And I told you before you have that counterexample with u. So if you don't take into account what's happening with you, then you're not, it's not gonna, you're not gonna have a hope. Uh, so what can you do? You want to somehow like take advantage of the fact that you have no advection essentially on the right. So you want to sort of weight the right more. And the, the, uh, the way to do this is by using relative entropies. So the very cool thing about this is with a, a normal entropy calculation, you have a steady state and you show you converge to the steady state by the entropy. Here we have no steady state. But the amazing thing is, is if you have another solution, then their ratio will actually satisfy, uh, you know, some quantity involving the ratio will be decreasing. So this goes back to this uh, paper by Michel, Michler, and uh, Pertom from about 20 years ago. They, they do a much more general case, but for us it's basically you take the same equation, you find a solution to it, and now that quantity is going to be decreasing. So that seems great, right? We're done. The problem is, we don't understand what phi looks like. Phi is one solution to the equation. Now we have to find another solution to the equation. So, okay, what do you take for rho? And then once you choose a rho, that's only decreasing. Again, we want a rate. Decreasing is better than nothing, but we, we need a, an actual explicit rate. Okay, so the first observation, uh, which isn't particularly sophisticated, you go through their calculations and you notice that actually you don't need a solution, you just need a super solution. Okay. And then uh, you sit there and you think, okay, uh, I need to weight the right more, I need something that's essentially one on the right and zero on the left. Well, u is one on the left and zero on the right. So like, you know, when you're, you've been banging your head against a wall for a long time working on something, you get desperate and you say, well, one minus u will be one on the right and zero on the left. So let's try it. Let's plug it in, and by some miracle, it, it actually works, okay? Uh, and the reason it works is the all the error terms are terms you can control with that quantitative steepness argument. Uh, let me say that we now understand exactly why this works. We can do this in a much more general framework. We got very lucky guessing it that time, but uh, it's not, uh, it's, 
There's, there's, there's like a principle behind it. So now we have a row. We have a differential. Well, we have at least a effect that's decreasing. We want a rate, which means we need a differential inequality. So you again, you go back to this wonderful paper by Michel Michler and Pertam. And you notice that they throw away a lot of terms. And if you keep track of what those terms are, it's exactly the gradient of that ratio that you care about. So now we have something that looks exactly like what you have for the heat equation. For the heat equation, you have the L2 norm of something on the left and the H1 norm on the right. Here we have a weighted L2 norm on the left and a weighted gradient norm on the right. So this is great. We, we've completed that first step, right? That first step is the, is the differential inequality. What was the second step for the heat equation? You take that differential inequality and you use the Nash inequality on the right-hand side. The Nash inequality is, of course, proved for, with a Fourier transform. Here, we have a weighted gradient, a weight in our, our, uh, our integrals. So the Fourier transform is going to be totally useless, right? The Fourier transform really needs a, uh, uh, a homogeneous environment. So you sit there and you think, okay, maybe we can prove something similar to it. So I put all these question marks to hopefully give you seed some doubt in your mind that there's no hope of this thing happening. But like, what can you actually expect? So on the right, your rho, which is 1 minus u, is basically just exactly 1. And then whatever you do for the Nash inequality should work. So you should get something from 0 to infinity that looks like that. Okay, it's not that nice because you don't actually have any control over rho yet because the whole point is you're trying to show control of rho. But let's just pretend for a moment. On the left, what should you expect? Well, that rho should decay very fast to zero on the left, which means on the left, your integral should be, you should be finite. And if your integral is finite, it's like you're on a compact domain. The Nash inequality doesn't work on a finite domain. So you should use something like a Poincaré inequality, which is very suitable because of the building we're in. So uh, I don't know, I was, when I was writing the talk, I got very excited that I got to talk about a Poincaré inequality uh, at the Institute of Poincaré. Anyways, so the problem here is that, so this gives you, this gives you a functional inequality. The issue is that it's, uh, it's linear in the terms. Above, you have a cubic on the right. And now usually linear is better because it's exponential decay, but if you're worried about something starting at infinity, you really need that cubic to really kick you down. The cubic push, pushes you down from a large value faster. Okay, the linear is better once you're already low, but it's not good once you're, if you're high. So it's not great, but okay, you can make it work. Uh, we got really stuck here trying to prove this. And then uh, at some point, uh, uh, you know, I was desperately looking through every paper I've ever seen on any sort of functional inequality. And there's a lovely introduction to a paper that Jean Dolbeau wrote where he basically says, listen, every single one of these inequalities is proved by finding something that's, you know, some quantity minus another quantity squared. That thing is positive. So to get the inequality you want, you, you know, multiply out the square, move the negative terms on the left-hand side, so then the less than or equal to the terms on the right-hand side, and blah, blah. And it turns out that's what you get. You say, okay, I kind of start with the inequality I'm looking for, and then I kind of backfill. And you get something that looks awful. It's this thing 584 uh, up to some conditions that you have to check. Those conditions for us are actually okay by this quantitative steepness thing. Um, but in any case, uh, by optimizing in theta, you get exactly what you want as if it were the Nash inequality, kind of. And it's enough to get the 1 over root t to k. The issue is there's that maximum in there, maximum of 1 and theta squared. And that ma maximum makes the constant in your decay rate depend very nonlinearly on the initial data. So as a result, you have no hope of doing this self this uh, jointness trick to get an L infinity bound out of here. Okay. But we got our L2 bound, right? Which, which was the whole point, which we decided was good enough for today. So we say, okay, few. All right. And I consulted, and I guess the right translation of few is oof. So there was some discussion, right? If it was few or if it was also few in French. But uh, uh, I think Florian got outvoted, so we decided oof. Uh, sorry, Florian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, OK, so that's, it's, it's, we've made it through the woods, right? We went on this, this crazy journey through all these different functions and functional inequalities, made it to the end, we celebrate, right? We wipe the sweat off our brow. Um, OK, so 
let's tie this back to some other models, right? So this was all for a very specific model. Where else do we see this kind of push-pull transition and these push-me-pull-you fronts? So another basic model, which actually has a very strong connection to Burger's FKPP, that I won't talk about today, but of course, uh, uh, something I'm very excited about, so if you want to talk about it, let me know. Uh, is this model up here, where you're adding a kind of weak Lie effect, depending on chi. And now you can toggle chi, and you can ask, is there going to be this push-pull transition? And for this, it's been known, because people have done phase plane stuff. Uh, so you see you know, exactly that chi equals 1 is when you transition from uh, pulled to push. push. Um, but before I talk about that, let me just talk about where it comes from. So there, okay, it's population dynamics with the weak Lie effect. A very cool thing is that you can relate this model uh, to uh, a model from branching Brownian motion. So usually with branching Brownian motion, you relate it to a reaction fusion equation, you're forced to have the KPP condition, which means you can't have an Lie effect or something like that. But if you add a kind of voting procedure to your branching Brownian motion, so that means that if you look at the tree of, uh, of genealogy and, and each individual gets a path ones and zeros down by some procedure, they get sort of randomly, you can actually get other things. And so this is from a, a paper by Etheridge, uh, Freeman, and Pennington. Uh, there they were doing it with uh, Alan Kahn, which is of course extremely not a Lee effect, or extremely not a KPP condition. Um, to get this, what you do is, depending on chi, you, uh, you, you toggle a, a, um, a probability that lets you kind of interpolate between the Alan Kahn model and the Fisher KPP model. You have to adjust the rate in order to get the right constant in front, but uh, you can get it from that way. So this is a pretty cool thing. Um, the sort of up to O of 1 estimates, uh, what I'm calling somewhat precise front asymptotics, has been done by, by this, new, this recent paper by uh, Tomas Giletti. It's very cool because it's an extremely general result. He basically just said, give me a reaction to fusion equation, ut equals uxx plus f of u. I don't care what it is entirely, but if it's traveling wave of speed 2, if it's traveling wave decay is like x e to minus x, then its front has to have 2t minus 3 halves like t plus o of 1. So it's just entirely by the traveling wave. If you have uh, a traveling wave that decays exponentially, doesn't have that linear term, then you get the 1 half log t, and you get the little o of log t. So this convergence isn't enough to get, this, this asymptotics isn't enough to get the convergence of the traveling wave. But OK, you know, if you write an extremely general result, right, it's hard to get uh, extremely precise results. So it's, it's a very cool paper. And then there's a, there's a generalization of this kind of model where you can do it for any Power. This has been done formally by a bunch of people, so Ibra von Sarlos, and then various papers by uh, Honich, Leach, and Needham. Uh, so that's one model. Another is uh, this kind of amazing paper of uh, Julien Berstiki, Eric Brunet, and uh, uh, Bernard de Reda. So they're all, I mean, uh, Eric Brunet is right down the street. Uh, so basically, what they do is they say, okay, nonlinearities are kind of awful, so let's remove the nonlinearity for Fisher KPP. But we want things to stay bounded, so we're going to put some boundary conditions. So what they do is they say, let's have a free boundary. Let's over-prescribe boundary conditions. You can choose a, a value of u and a derivative of u. And based on that, they can read off the asymptotics. And the way they do it is like this absolutely amazing computation where you get some integral quantity that has to be equal to some other integral quantity. And you start looking at um, uh, singularities. And uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's just amazing. It's formal. It's not rigorous. But uh, OK. Every, everything that's ever been verified coming from this paper is always, uh, is always correct. So it's, they're, they're clearly into something amazing. Um, and then, uh, okay, so then the next talk, Mitte, we'll talk about uh, some aerotaxis models. It's sort of related to this push pull transition. There's a, a thing with diffusion where you see the, the traveling wave change. I think that's only been analyzed at the level of traveling waves. And, uh, and then I want to say, so what I was hoping to talk about today was actually like the very general result. So all of this stuff we actually understand now completely in a, in a, in a very general framework. It's not just for Berger's Fisher KVP. It's for basically any reaction infusion uh, scalar case which uh, has this push-pull transition or any advective uh, reaction fusion equation that has this push-pull transition. And the kind of amazing thing is that you're essentially, there's a, a completely explicit way to go from one model to the other and back. And it's very important to understand this because when you, when you try to do the convergence of the wave, you kind of always want to go back and forth. So there's some sort of explicit way of doing this. So this, we're in the process of typing this, hopefully, okay, May, June, I don't know, sometime soon. 
All right. Thanks for your attention. Any question from the audience? There's one up there. <laughs> it's a walk now. And uh, is there such a transition when you do the non local fish TPP? So you want to have. Um, like I mean, a, a non-local uh, turn that's positive. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, there's a paper by Britain from the late 80s, early 90s. I think he analyzes the traveling wave uh, behavior for this. Um, I haven't looked at it for a long time. Uh, for the moment, this quantitative steepness really relies on having a uh, like a very precise structure. So I think that when you go to the non-local one, that will break that. There's some things you can say. So with uh, Contengriette and Olga Turanova, we're looking at a, a fischer kv chemotaxis model. And there you see, that, okay, there's a non-locality in here. And there you see that there's a range where your speed is two. And then uh, there's some threshold that we don't know. And beyond that, you can get the precise asymptotics of what the speed goes to infinity like. Uh, but the issue is that it, since it's so much more complicated, since there's less structure, it's very hard to say precise things like in these kind of simple models. Is there something which is deeply scalar in your proof? Or could you, for instance, do the same uh, analysis for simple systems, let's say, uh, Octa Volterra competitive systems, where you have a transition between pulled and pushed? I think so, and it's something uh, I haven't had a chance to really sit down and try. But um, I mean, okay, so so certainly you need a system where you have comparison. But the the thing that I think is really nice about this quantitative steepness is that oftentimes with phase plane analysis you can prove so much more than you can ever hope to do for the Cauchy problem uh, because you have these trapping regions. You can do some sort of like. Uh, so kind of like first touching arguments that you can't do once you have time because it's another dimension. And this gives us a way to pass from all the things you get from phase plane analysis to, uh, uh, to the Cauchy problem. So what I think would be a good thing to think about, maybe not getting exactly the precise push-pull stuff, but what extra information uh, for systems can you pull from the phase plane analysis to the Cauchy problem? And that's something I would like to try doing. But you probably know more about this than me, just because, yeah, I'm a scalar guy. OK, thanks. I think we should uh, move on to the next speaker. Thanks again, Chris.